Thanks for watching. If you would like to support the show, please donate at patreon.com slash forgotten battles. Please see the show notes for info. William Walker was born in Nashville, Tennessee in 1824. He grew up middle class, but his father James Walker invested in steamboats and the family began to move up the economic ladder. His family wealth grew and so did the family's political influence. Walker's mother, Mary Norville, became good friends of the prominent Polk family, including James K. Polk, who would later be elected President of the United States. Walker was surrounded at a young age by the idea of Americans as the torchbearers of a new world. His family owned slaves, and they were tied closely to the Southern economy. Walker was intelligent, sensitive, aristocratic, and devoid of a sense of humor. He was also sexually prudish and detested derogatory language in anything he deemed low-class speech. He had what was described by his contemporaries as dead and lifeless eyes. Walker was raised with stories from his grandfather, Lipscomb Norville, who was a Revolutionary War veteran. Lipscomb fought at Trenton and Brandywine and survived the winter at Valley Forge. Young William Walker admired his grandfather above all others and wanted martial glory, but did not seem to show much interest in actually joining the military. Walker would eventually find what he thought was a better way. Walker graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a medical degree and practiced before becoming bored and departing for New Orleans to study law. He soon found that dull and moved on to become an editor of the New Orleans Crescent, one of the city's major newspapers. Walker became obsessed with the ideas of manifest destiny, the belief that American expansion was a kind of holy crusade in the name of progress and Western civilization. After the annexation of Texas, Manifest Destiny was popularized through the Young America movement, which became even more popular with the election of Franklin Pierce. Walker found the cause that defined his life, and he believed filibustering was the best way to fulfill his destiny. Filibustering was the practice of forming a private military to colonize areas, especially in Central and South America for the United States. The U.S. government mostly didn't support this type of foreign adventurism. Many saw it akin to piracy, and the filibusters as nothing more than pillaging mercenaries. Walker, though, considered it as a way to promote the American ideal, but especially the culture of the American South. Walker wanted more land that could be used for plantations. He constantly stated the virtues of founding new slave states for what he saw as a United States that was not finished growing. Walker wanted to annex parts of Mexico, Nicaragua, and even Cuba. Walker did not act right away on his the new gospel of expansion. In 1850, Walker relocated to San Francisco. He took a job with the Daily Herald and he became a firebrand columnist who advocated for vigilante violence. Walker fought duels with a few of his enemies and he was wounded in the leg. Walker mercilessly attacked corrupt political officials in San Francisco and became popular with the middle class as a man of the people. His days as a newspaper man came to an end after making too many enemies among the San Francisco elite. He contemplated filibustering himself instead of just cheering from the sidelines. The Sonora Desert in northern Mexico seemed like a good place for William Walker to start his career. He set his eyes on the Baja Peninsula. Walker toured the area and decided he should invade with an army under the guise of protecting the local people from Apache raiders. Walker asked the Mexican government for permission to found a colony in the area to act as a protectorate. The Mexicans, fresh from losing Texas for similar reasons, refused his offer and were wary of his true intentions. Walker returned to California to plan his next move. Walker began to travel all over the United States recruiting men to join him to create what he called the Republic of Sonora. Walker's idea was to create this republic similar to Texas, which would act as a defensive protectorate against Apache attacks into the United States. Inevitably, when this proved to be a good idea, the United States would change their tune about filibustering and admit Sonora as a new state. Walker saw this mission as not only fulfilling his desire for military glory, but also as a way to force the United States to expand for its own defensive interests. To fund the expedition, he sold bonds to investors worth seven square miles of the future Republic of Sonora.
Walker invaded Mexico in 1853 with 45 men, and he swiftly took the undefended town of La Paz and declared himself president with the rank of colonel. He even designed an original flag of the Republic of Sonora. He also set the Republic's laws as word for word of that of the state of Louisiana, of which he was very familiar. Walker's rule of Baja was marred by lack of supplies and the necessary manpower to cement his authority. Resistance to him was formed quickly and proved to be more than Walker could handle. Walker decided to move his small force to Cabo San Lucas in the hopes of recruiting more soldiers. As Walker's small force was leaving La Paz, they were ambushed by Mexican soldiers and the local militia. The fight was brief, but Walker dubbed it the Battle of La Paz and wired back to San Diego that he had won a great victory. In reality, he was still retreating as the ship carrying his supplies sailed without his orders and abandoned them. Walker next held up in a fortified manor house with well-placed cannon. Walker repelled the attack easily despite being outnumbered. Walker even led an attack out of his fortified position at night, scattering the militia. A Mexican landholder named Antonio Melendrez proved to be more than a capable adversary of Walker. Melendrez's men harassed Walker and attacked him regularly. Walker seized Melendrez's land and property, but could not hold most of it. Shortly after the victory at the manor house, Walker was reinforced by 200 Mexicans and 200 men from San Francisco. Lacking supplies, though, many of these new recruits deserted when Walker moved towards Sonora. Melendrez caught up with Walker's rear guard and executed 12 of his men. Walker's army was reduced to 33 men. Walker was eventually forced to surrender to the United States Marines in 1854. Despite the blatant illegality of his actions and the haphazard way in which he undertook the expedition, national sentiment was mostly with him. One paper in California wrote, So will America conquer and annex all lands, that is, her manifest destiny. Only give her time for the process to swallow up every few years a province as large as the kingdoms of Europe. That is her present rate of progress. Sometimes she purchases the mighty morsel, Sometimes she forged it from waste territory by the natural increase of her own people. Sometimes she annexes, and sometimes she conquers it. Nevertheless, in California, Walker was arrested and put on trial for an illegal war. Walker was acquitted easily in eight minutes of jury deliberation. One paper commented, America secures the spoils won by her hand, however dishonestly they may have come. Support for Walker climbed high, especially in the southern states. Walker returned to newspaper work but quickly got bored and convinced himself that he would have been successful in Mexico if not for a little more good luck and better planning. Walker's support for slavery intensified at this time, even though he did not own any slaves. Yet, his support for the institution was undoubted as he wrote favorably of the admission of more slave states. Also, he specifically wanted slavery to be legal in the Republic of Sonora. As such, most of his recruits were white Southerners. It wasn't long before Walker was at it again. Before the Panama Canal was dug, Nicaragua was the best connection between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Ships would enter the San Juan River and cross to Lake Nicaragua and then take a small overland route before embarking on the other side. Because of this, Nicaragua took on special importance to the believers of Manifest Destiny and the U.S. government. In 1854, a civil war broke out between the cities of Granada and León. Granada was a stronghold of the Conservative Party, and the Liberal Party was based in Lyon. The Liberal Party began looking for allies anywhere they could find them, and asked for support from William Walker. The Liberals had already begun hiring mercenaries to help fill out their ranks, and many Americans went to Nicaragua in the hopes of making a fortune. Many of these Americans recommended contacting William Walker. President Francisco Castellan drew up a contract with Walker, who formed a mercenary army. They set sail in 1855 with 60 men, with hopes to link up with the Democratic forces near the port of Rivas. Walker arrived and was reinforced by 100 Americans and 200 Nicaraguan regulars. They attacked Rivas and were repulsed easily. Walker wasted no time and decided to rethink his strategy and do something unexpected. He sailed his army straight to Granada. He attacked the unprepared conservative army and routed them at the Battle of La Vergen on September 3, 1855. 
He captured the city the next month and declared himself the president of Nicaragua. He was the general of all the forces of the democratic cause and had almost no political opposition from the legitimate government, many of which had died in the battle with the conservatives. Walker was now supreme leader of the most important trade route through Central America. Unsurprisingly, President Franklin Pierce recognized Walker's government as the legitimate ruler of Nicaragua in 1856. Walker declared English the official language of Nicaragua and repealed Nicaragua's laws against slavery. He also had the defeated conservatives' lands redistributed with the intent of setting up a southern-style plantation system. Walker got to work very quickly. It seems he already had much of this planned out in the event of his victory showing he always intended to take power at the first chance he got. Walker claimed his victory was the fulfillment of an old prophecy, although this was certainly fabricated. His propaganda began to call him the gray-eyed man of destiny. Walker also wanted to import African slaves into Nicaragua. These moves and proclamations began enticing southern whites to relocate to Nicaragua with promises of land. Steamers left the port of New Orleans twice a month and he would pay half the cost of passage. Mercenaries from all over the world began to sail to Nicaragua. Walker's ranks soon had French, German, and American mercenaries. Walker's exploits were celebrated across America. He did have his detractors, but they were mostly in the abolitionist press, while Britain was opposed to his plans to restore the transatlantic slave trade. Not long after he took power, the remnants of the conservative and liberal parties put their differences aside and allied to remove William Walker from power. Juan Porras, president of Costa Rica, formed an army that included Nicaraguans, Hondurans, the army of El Salvador, and many of his own Costa Rican regular troops. Porras was also backed by wealthy American industrialist Cornelius Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt's businesses used Nicaragua for the movement of their cargo, and Walker had taken many of Vanderbilt's ships and company property. Vanderbilt even sent mercenaries of his own. The coalition army invaded in 1857 and Walker abandoned Granada and ordered his men to burn down the city before retreating. Walker's 1,500-man army set to the task, and while doing so, were surrounded by the coalition forces. Walker ordered his army to break out to Rivas, where they were set upon by the coalition. A military drummer named Juan Santa Maria sacrificed himself to set fire to Walker's headquarters. This blow put Walker's army into confusion and ultimately led to a rout. As they retreated, they contaminated the wells in Rivas, which sparked a cholera epidemic. After the Second Battle of Rivas, Walker surrendered to the U.S. government and sailed to New York City a hero's welcome. Walker, as he often did, blamed bad luck in the U.S. for not backing his efforts. Walker wrote a book about his exploits which sold well, and he still planned to retake Nicaragua. He met with President James Buchanan and discussed his plans to return and reform the government he felt was still legitimate. Walker did not go on trial for his exploits in Nicaragua. He raised money and more men and returned to Central America and began to style himself General William Walker. Walker set sail for Trujillo, Honduras to reestablish his empire. He was captured by the British Navy and they determined that letting him go would only likely start another war in Central America and destabilize the region further. The British Navy turned him over to Honduran authorities. They swiftly executed Walker on September 12, 1860 by firing squad at close range. William Walker's competency is debatable. Walker executed his own men as deserters, many of which were also investors. He had little grasp of how to manage resources and was unable to follow up any of his successes other than naming himself president of Nicaragua, which was short-lived. He frequently had no control over his men, and they often pillaged and rarely fought sober. He showed a decent understanding of military tactics despite having no formal military training, but his leadership skills always faltered. Walker was a strategic blunderer who always seemed to be surprised when he was attacked and not on the offensive. Walker's colonialist policies in Nicaragua and his attempts to expand slavery are also especially appalling. Walker's callousness also showed him to be a cruel man who did not seem to care about the human toll of manifest destiny or his quest for glory. Walker's attempts to privatize military action and try to rethink how America expanded its territory also failed. Yet, no matter how awry things got for him, 
he never seemed to lose much popular support. Walker embodied in an era of American history dominated by expansion. Yet, while in the 1800s he was one of the country's most famous men, he was mostly forgotten in the 20th century. In Nicaragua and Central America, though, he is well known. The airport in San Jose, Costa Rica is named for Juan Santa Maria, who is considered a national hero of Costa Rica. His act of torching Walker's headquarters is depicted in a statue in his hometown. There is an anthem to his deed, and Juan Santa Maria Day is celebrated every April 11th as a national holiday in Costa Rica.